Tonight's guest is John Kershaw. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Vic. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. John, please give us a brief bio on yourself. No worries, mate. I'm 32 years old from Sydney, Australia. I do civil construction, but I did used to train uh, race horses, which helped me with my encounters for think like working out how heavy these creatures might have been. You said you used to work with race horses. What kind of race horses? Standard bred, so the trotters and pacers that have the gig on them. If you know about them. Oh yeah, yeah I do. Wow, that had to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it was awesome. Oh, I'm sure it was. Let's set a baseline, John. Before you had your first dogman encounter, what were your thoughts on their existence? I actually thought it was all a bit of a lie. I thought it was someone made it up and used to laugh about it. Oh, yeah, someone's been followed through the bush by a werewolf and used to laugh about it all the time. There wasn't many photos out there that really showed the creature. It might have been an eye or an ear from 500 metres away taken on. It looked like an old 1920 camera, like, and you couldn't work out it was anything. It could have been a leaf or anything in the bush, so I used to laugh about it. But once I had my encounters, that sort of changed pretty dramatically. Yeah, that's how it normally goes. You just admitted to us that you thought they were a joke before you had your two encounters, but what were your thoughts on Yowies? Yeah, well, I'd had recently had a couple of encounters with Yowies, and I knew that they existed in that. But yeah, I just couldn't really fathom the idea of a creature that looks like a werewolf running through the bush. So yeah, I just which is pretty silly by me. Like if I thought and knew Yowies existed, I should have known anything could really. Well, as you know, there are a lot of people out there who are convinced the Bigfoot, Yowies are out there, but they think dogmen are a joke. You know better now. Yeah, exactly. They wake me up pretty quickly. I'll bet they did. What can you tell us about where your two dogmen encounters happened? Uh, I was in a river system in uh, Western Sydney. It was about 25, 30 minute drive from basically the main street in Sydney. So it was right in a really heavily populated area. Within two minute drive of where I parked my ute at the river, it was probably two, three hundred thousand houses spread out all over the area, like really heavily populated. And some of the houses back onto the river and stuff, like it's pretty crazy the like the location of it. There's this idea out there that to have a dogman encounter, you've got to be in the middle of nowhere, but that's not always the case, as you found out. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content. That's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. Have you spent much time in the bush, John? What are your bush credentials? Yeah, I've always been around the bush. When I was a kid, I'd go out with my uncles and uh, any other family members and that. We're always in the bush. My, the town I live in basically backs onto every direction, heavy bush, and we're only about 20 minutes from one section of the Blue Mountains and I'd always grown up around the bush going shooting and hunting when I was a teenager with my uncles and stuff like that and being out fishing in my kayaks. So I've spent probably more time in the bush than I have in the big cities. What's the scariest experience you've had in the bush that wasn't dogman related? A couple of yowie encounters were pretty scary, but just if you weren't going to go with cryptids and that, just being down the river, stuck in a spot in my kayak, a snake in the water after me trying to get away from a brown snake. If anyone knows about the eastern brown snake, you get bitten by one of them, you really got probably an hour at the absolute most to get to a hospital or you're dead. So the snakes are pretty bad and the spiders aren't too bad. But, yeah, the snakes, they'll get you if they got the chance. Yeah, you guys have a lot of things over there that can kill you. Yeah. When you were a kid, you had a frightening experience one night that involved a quote-unquote police dog. What's the story behind that? Yeah, um, after I'd had my dog man encounters, I'd sort of forgotten it. And it's a bit weird because as soon as my dad reminded me of it, it was like a switch was flicked and I remembered completely. And I've had a couple of friends say to me, maybe the encounter, whatever the creature was, it actually somehow made me forget what had happened. And me dad mentioning it to me might have been enough that sort of unlocked that memory. But I was four or five year old I can't really remember it was 
that long ago. And um, I remember after he reminded me, I remembered waking up middle of the night. And back then, Dad used to sleep in a spare room at the front of the house because he was the milkman. So he'd get up at two o'clock in the morning and he'd sleep up the front so he didn't wake mum and my sister and that up at the back of the house and go get up and go to work without waking anyone up. And it was about two o'clock in the morning, so just before he was going to get up for work, and I heard a noise outside that woke me up, and I pulled the blinds back and looked out, and as I looked out, there was a head of a dog with a paws leaning on the windowsill outside looking me straight in the eyes. I screamed and closed the blinds and ran into my dad's room and said, Dad, there's a police dog at the window. And he said, oh, yeah, don't be silly. Just jump into bed go back to sleep. It was about five minutes later, there was a couple of pot plants out in the garden, got smashed, and that's when he jumped up and flicked the light on and ran outside. He didn't see anything, but it was just really weird. And like he said when he was talking to me about it, he goes, I've never seen a dog in the middle of the night with no lights on, standing up on back legs to lean on a windowsill to be looking in a window, and it to be right at the time that I pulled the blinds back and actually was looking it in the eyes. So, And I called it a police dog because that's what I used to, any German shepherd I seen, that was the name I used to have for him. Oh, it's a police dog. Oh, there's a police dog at the window. Yeah, he thought it was funny. But now after my encounters and he's seen some of the things I've got on camera and that, he thinks it might have been one of them, if not a pup or like a, maybe a pup if you'd call a younger juvenile dog man a pup. Yeah, so that was that bit of a encounter I had. Sounds like it might have been one. To be looking you in the eyes through that window, though, how tall would it have had to have been? Not too tall. Like, it was probably the bottom of the windowsill was probably sitting at about three or four foot like that, but it had its paws on it, so it was standing higher than what I was. And me being that age, I only just had my head basically to the height of the windowsill, so it wouldn't have been really big unless it was hunched over, but being dark, it was so dark outside, all I could see was the dog's head right at the window looking at me so I couldn't see past it to see if it was bent over looking at me or it was at my height or not. It does make you wonder. Can you remember anything about its eyes being strange or did they seem to be normal? No, nah, well I couldn't see its eyes properly and I just remember it blinking a few times and that was about it because it was that dark outside. It was I'm surprised I actually seen its eyes, but I distinctly remember it blinking, but that's about all. It was just the head of a German shepherd, yeah, right at me window and with its paws on the window, so it was pretty creepy. It sounds like it. Odds are it was a German shepherd type dog, but we'll never know. All we can do is guess. Yeah, exactly. If you've had a dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. All right, John, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. No worries, Vic. Well, I'll get into the first encounter I had. This encounter, I'd gotten up really early to go fishing, and after the couple of encounters I'd had with Yowies, I started to go fishing in the daylight hours. So I was getting up at, say, 3 in the morning, and I'd be on the water by 4, and I'd fish through the darkness and first light was always the best fishing time, so I'd do that. I had a yowie encounter, and it freaked me out a bit too much. So I decided from then on I'd always fish at like just after the sun come up. So I jumped in the car. It was about around 5 o'clock. I jumped in the car, had my kayak on the ute, and was driving down the road, and I was going to pull in the Maccas and get a coffee. And I got the Maccas and realized I'd forgotten my wallet. And I thought that was a bit weird. I always have my wallet on me because – in Australia, you got to have your fishing license on you. If you don't, you can get fined and they'll take your fishing gear and your kayak and stuff. So I'd always had it with me because I didn't want to lose $1,000 worth of like all my gear and that. So yeah, but I thought it was a bit weird. I rushed home, grabbed my wallet, got the coffee, got heading over to this spot I was going to fish in this river system. And yeah, it was over Western Sydney. So it was about half an hour drive from my house and I'd been fishing at this spot a few times and pulled up to the gate and the gate was actually locked and which I thought was a bit odd because I'd fished over there probably three or four times in the last week and the gate had never been locked. So this river you go into the through the gates and like on the other side of the river's a national park. So at night they actually locked the gates, which I didn't know until this had happened. But so I'd luckily been there a few times and they'd obviously forgotten to close the gate. And 
So I pulled up at the gate, seen it was locked, and thought, oh, what am I going to do? And I was thinking about a little spot my father-in-law had actually told me about. He used to go swimming and fishing and stuff with his mates when he was younger. So I jumped onto the Google Maps and I was having a look, and it was only about a five-minute drive from where I was. So I decided to head over to this spot and thought I'd be good. It's a new spot. Hopefully it's pretty good. And I was coming through the gateway at this new spot, and the gate was unlocked. And I thought, well, that's weird. The other gate was locked. This one's open. And just as I come through the gateway, my Spotify, I was playing some songs in the car, in the ute, and it glitched out and it went to a song that I'd never heard before and I don't have it in my playlist. And I was listening to like my private repeat all playlist where all the bet- all your favourite songs are. And this has glitched out to a different song. And the words of the chorus was, you know, that this is a bad idea. And I thought, hang on, that's a bit weird. And as soon as that happened, it glitched out again and went back to the same song that I was listening to and I thought, I thought nothing of it. I thought that's a bit weird and kept driving. So I got to the spot and I pulled up and got all my kayak off the view, got all my fishing gear out, chucked it in the kayak, started heading down the river. Uh, I got probably five minutes down from the ute and realised I'd forgotten my GoPro. I thought, oh crap, so I quickly ran back up, grabbed my GoPro, chucked it on and got going. So there's another thing that I just kept forgetting all these things this morning and I never forget all this stuff like Every time I go, it's always the same. Like I've got it set out, ready to go. I plan it. Nothing goes wrong. So I've gotten down. It took me about half an hour to get to the river, like actually into the water with a kayak. A lot of bush bashing, having to rip branches out of the way to get down there. And I jumped into the kayak and went to paddle off. And it was that shallow. I was actually, the kayak was stuck on the bottom. I thought, ah, crap. So I actually had to drag the kayak through the rocks and the sand and that until I hit a deeper spot. And once I hit the deepest spot, I was like, how good is this? The water was so clear and there was a lot of snags in the water that I could go and target. And I thought, how good is this going to be? And I had my first cast out and as soon as the surface lure hit the water, I was retrieving it. I had five or six fish hitting it at the same time, trying to hook up and finally hooked one, dragged it back to the boat, chucked it out, cast out again, same thing, another five or six trying to hit it at the same time. And every cast I had, it actually did that the same. I'd have five or six or three or four fish, like it was always more than one fish hitting these lures at the same time. I thought, how good is this? It's like my own little oasis. The river I'd gone to, like I was saying, it took 30 minutes to get down there and there was a good chance no one had ever been down there with a kayak fishing before because the average person in a kayak's not going to go down there, same with fishing, like fishing out of the kayak. They're not going to go through all that effort to get in the water when there's all these different spots around in this same area that you could go to that was easy to get into the water. So I was thinking maybe I'm actually the first one down here. How good's this? And I was so excited. I'd been to a few spots before this and not caught anything. So I thought, I'm going to come here all the time. And I was paddling down the river to this next snag I was going to target. And I seen this little grey flash in the bush out to my left. And I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. And I paid no attention to it. I thought maybe a bit of sun had hit my Polaroid glasses at the wrong angle and sort of just blanked them out or something and thought nothing of it. And further down the river on the right, there was a heap of cockatoos in the trees and if you guys know what cockatoos sound like they make a racket so they're down to the right going berserk and i thought nothing of it kept fishing along same thing casting out hooking a fish straight away like i was having so much fun and i seen this big rock on the left hand side of the river and i thought yep i'm going to target that for sure there's going to be a big one over there so i've made my way over there cast in the water as soon as it hit the water like instantly got smashed by a fish fought it fought it brought it in unhooked it, chucked it in the water. Same thing, I kept thinking, how good is this place? And I did a big long cast out to my right to hit the right-hand bank. And as this lure hit the water, a creature up in the bush to the right started screaming and running through the bush towards me. You could hear it smashing branches out of the way, just screaming and roaring as loud as it could. And you could hear its footsteps running through the bush and it was running, crash, crash, and then you'd hear it smash a branch out of the way and you could see the bushes moving as this creature was running towards me. And it actually had stopped just out of sight of me. And at that time, it had stopped. It started howling at me. I hooked the fish. I'm winding it in. And I was thinking, oh, no, what's that? And I'd already cast out and I'd just give it a little bit of a wind. And as I'd given it a wind, it'd bring the lure in so I could get out of there. I hooked the fish. So I'm fighting the fish back to the kayak and this creature's still screaming and roaring as loud as it could and you'd actually feel it in your chest when it was roaring. And I was starting to panic and I got the fish back to the kayak and peeled it up, 
pulled the hooks out. As soon as I chucked it into the water, this creature went to a whole another level. Its roars got so much louder and you could hear it smashing branches out of the way and the cockatoos were actually going ballistic at this time. And now that I think about it, I was thinking like these cockatoos might have known this creature was already there and that's why they were squawking and going off as I was coming down the river. So I chucked the fish into the water and as I, I just decided I'm just going to turn around and paddle back to the car and act like I didn't hear it. As I started to turn around, I heard a voice in my head say, go now or you will die. And I don't know what it was. I'd never heard that voice before. It wasn't my thoughts or anything, but it was definitely a voice in my head said, go now or you'll die. So I've turned around and just paddled off nice and gently, just acting like I didn't hear what was going on. I was just trying to play silly and not let this creature know that I was actually scared. I thought if I panic here and take off, this creature's liable to take off after me and come and get me. And I'd gotten about 50 metres down the river and it just stopped. Didn't hear another roar, didn't hear another branch being broken, didn't even hear a twig snap. And I've paddled back, got back to the where it, to the bit of the river where it got really shallow, dragged the kayak through the sand and the rocks. Uh, I jumped out of the kayak, I chucked all my rocks up on the ledge there and as I put the last rod down, I went to turn around and a, something had actually hit the rod and it knocked it over. And I thought, oh no, something's obviously something had thrown a rock at me and a, this is when I panicked because I'm thinking I've still got 30 minutes of bush bashing to get up to the ute and so i've quickly dragged the kayak out of the water and when i take the kayak because i'm always going in the bush and that'll usually just drag it along there's nothing that will scratch it it's usually just grass or little branches i've got to go over so it's not too bad and this time i actually grabbed all my gear grabbed the kayak chucked it up on my shoulder and started walking through the bush and so i'm thinking there's something on the other side of the river and it's going to get across pretty easy after me so i chucked it on my shoulder i started heading through the bush i thought if I'm doing that, I'm not dragging the kayak. It's not making all this noise. I might be able to hear if anything comes through the water and is after me. So I've got to a set of stairs. It's probably about three, 400 metres up these stairs and you're at the ute. And I actually ran to the ute, ran up all these stairs with the kayak on my shoulder, got up there, chucked it all in the back of the ute, jumped in the car and I was petrified. I was just shaking. I couldn't even turn the car on. And I pulled my phone out and messaged a couple of my mates on the Australian Yowie research website to say, look, this is what's happened. And yeah, I was sitting there and I'm trying to work out what this creature was, what had happened. And that's when I realized, hang on, I've had the GoPro running the whole time. So I've actually got the encounter. I'd actually caught it on the GoPro and I'd listened to it a few times when I was there and you could faintly hear the creature roaring in the background because I had just encountered and just had this experience. So I could actually hear it, but you can hear cockatoos and that. I've put it on the internet on my YouTube account and it's very hard to hear because the GoPro audio is good for when you're close up or you're sort of talking into the camera, but any sort of outside audio, it's, it's pretty bad. So you just basically hear the cockatoos going berserk and then you sort of faintly hear these roars in the background. But anyway, so I'd listened to it a few times. I was like, wow, I can hear it. So I pulled my phone out. I've looked up kangaroos koalas wallabies wombats all the australian animals even dingoes and wild dogs listen to all the noise that they've made noises they make their mating calls their calls they have when they're angry or scared and there was nothing i could find the only thing i could find on the internet that sounded like this creature was the roar it sounded like a big male lion the thing that got me was it would roar and on its inhale before it did the next roar the breath that it was take this creature was taking was actually that loud. It actually sounded like another vocalization, and, and I worked out so the main roar sounded like a lion, but then that breath nearly sounded like a grizzly bear, and I was petrified. I sat there for probably about an hour, hour and a half before I could actually get the courage to turn the car on and get out of there because I was just that shaken up. I couldn't see properly because I'd had an anxiety attack and stuff, so I was like. I can't go now because I'm liable to have a crash on the way out. And I'd gotten home and showed the girlfriend my footage and she could hear the roars. And, yeah, so that was that was that day and that was the first encounter with this creature. And at the time, I'd actually thought it might have been a yowie because, as I was saying, I didn't believe in dogmen. I thought they were a bit of a joke. And three days later is when I had another encounter with a creature and actually got a few photos of it. So that's when it all lined up and I'd realised that it was actually a dog man. So it was three days after the last encounter I just had. It still gets the hairs on the back of my neck standing up just talking about it. 
so the next encounter was, yeah, like I was saying, it was three days after the first encounter with this dog man. I'd went to another spot over there and I thought, I'm not going anywhere near this. I'm going to this other spot. It's closer to town. And I know if I head left, it's the opposite direction to where this encounter had happened. And I know it's just over a kilometre, probably about 1,500 metre paddle down, and I'm actually in nearly the main street of a big city. So I thought if anything goes down, I can take off down there and I know I'm safe. If I get down there and something's happened, I can get down there, ring either the girlfriend, she can get one of her brothers or my brother-in-law or someone maybe come over there you, to pick me up in the kayak and then take me back to the car. So it was about six o'clock when I'd gotten in the water. The sun was up by this time and I had my first cast and caught a fish and I'm paddling along and I'm just about 10 minutes into it. I was like, how good is this? This bit of the river is awesome. There's nothing going on. I'm close to people. There's a bridge that goes over the river up ahead. There's a bit further down, there was a railway bridge. I'm thinking, oh, how good is this? There's going to be people around me all the time. I'm not going to have to worry. And So I'm fishing along, happy as. I'd actually, in between this encounter and the previous one, I'd bought a new kayak. So I was out for the first time in it. And how good is this? I'm trying out new techniques of the way I could paddle, the way I could stand up in the kayak and actually fish. And I was loving it. And yeah, it was about 10, 15 minutes into the session. I heard a twig snap out to my left and I thought nothing of it. I thought it's just a branch and kangaroo or wallaby in there. I won't have to worry about it. So I went to paddle off. I was going to head down the river a bit to a section I wanted to target. And as I took a stroke with the paddle, I heard something massive. Like I was saying, I used to train racehorses. So when you get a crazy, like a crazy horse and it's real skittish, you'd we used to tend to take him into the bush, on the tracks through the bush where there's animals around and the wind's blowing, the trees are moving. And after a while, you'll get that skittish part of them out of the horse. You could settle them right down and make them bomb proof. They won't gallop in their races. And it's just really good you get them out in the bush. So I know the sound of a four, 500 kilo racehorse moving through the bush. I know the sound of it walking on sand, on the different styles of tracks, on the grass, everything. I'm, I've got that down pretty well. and. This creature, it took a step and I thought that's something bigger than a kangaroo and I took three or four strokes with the paddle and this creature took three or four steps and I thought that thing's big, like this thing sounded anything over four or five hundred kilos walking through the really thick bush, like I couldn't see it in the bush, it was that thick. So I thought this is a bit weird and I paddled a bit more and every stroke of the paddle I took, this creature took a step. I stopped paddling, this creature would stop walking. I'd paddle a few times really quick. This creature would take a few real quick steps and it was it was taking a step to every stroke of the paddle I was taking and I thought, this is a bit weird. This sort of feels like I'm being stalked. And this one, I, I panicked a bit and I thought, I'm going to head back for the ute and then that's when I realised, hang on, this creature's on the same side of the river as my ute. And now yeah, I've gotten down a bit further. I was nearly a kilometre from the ute and like I was saying, every time I'd paddle, this creature would walk and I still I couldn't see it, and then it was freaking me out a bit. Something and great, there's something here too, and I don't know what to do. And I had the idea; I'd already worked it out. Like I was saying, I'd paddle down further, and I'd go down to this city and jump out there where there's there are always people walking along the river. There, there's a bike track. People go down there, grab a coffee, and go for a walk. So I'm like, I'm going down there, and I'd gotten about a kilometre from my ute, and I seen something black out to my left in the bush and I'd actually fished at this snag on the river before so I knew what the bush line was like in this area and there was this black I could just see this black thing in the bush and I'd never seen it before I, I knew it was something that wasn't supposed to be there and I pulled my phone out took a few photos and then kept on paddling down towards this city and once I'd taken the photos put the phone back in my pocket paddled off I'd realized that whatever this creature was it had stopped taking steps to my each one of my strokes and I thought this is a bit weird and so I've kept paddling nothing didn't hear a twig snap or nothing after that I'd gotten a couple hundred meters down the river pulled over to the right but I'm going to pull up have a drink have a cigarette I pull my phone out to have a look and that's when I seen the face of a, a massive dog in the bush when I'd zoomed in on the photos and my heart sank I was like this was a time that I thought straight away oh wow dog men are real because that's exactly what this creature was. It was a massive dog. At first, I estimated the creature was standing about seven foot tall from the way the 
I thought the bank fell and stuff. And later on, I've been back with friends and we worked out it's a lot bigger than that. But that's when I, I sort of panicked and I thought, what am I going to do? Do I head back down to this city or do I head back to the ute? And I started paddling back towards the ute. I never heard one noise again after that. That whole way back to the ute, I I paddled that far, so I would have won a gold medal at the Olympics. So I took off. I got back to the ute. I sort of sat around in the water for five or six minutes before I got out just to make sure. I was scanning through the bush to look around to make sure there was nothing there. Quickly jumped out, chucked the kayak on the back of the ute and sped off home. So now I've got home and shown the girlfriend my photos and even she she freaked out a bit when she seen it. She's like, what is that? It looks, what'd she say? She thought, she goes, it looks like a, like a monkey. And then I zoomed in and she's like, oh no, it's got a massive long snout and big pointy ears. And that was the encounter. Not for the faint of heart. No, nah, not at all. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. What's the fallout been like for you after having those encounters? At first, I was pretty bad. Like, I think I mentioned to you, I'd wake up in the middle of the night hearing those howls that I'd heard in the first encounter. I'd hear them in my dreams and wake up. And as soon as I wake up, I knew I was at home, so I was all right. And I'd have the odd dream where I'd see the face of this dog man that I'd gotten in the photos looking at me and sort of wake me up and freak me out a bit but I haven't been too bad but I have actually pretty much not gone back in the river by myself I go with my friends or with my friends my brother-in-law I won't go out at night in my kayak by myself and it hasn't been too bad but I've sort of stayed away from a lot of it so I am reckon if I did actually try I'd be pretty traumatized by it but I've just sort of stuck to fish in the daylight hours and keep away but it was pretty full on the first couple of months and I knew I posted the photos on the Australian Yowie website asking them what they thought it was and I told them I think it's a dog man and I thought it was silly and but I've actually got it on photo now and they all said to me like I've got to get back there and take some more photos to make sure it's not pareidoli or it's not a stump and stuff like that and I couldn't do it until two of my good friends, Yowie Dan and Attila Caldy, they decided they'd come out with me and we'd go and investigate the area. So we went out in the kayaks. My brother-in-law come with me too and we paddled around. It took a long time to work out exactly where I'd taken the photo in the bush line because the bush had changed a little bit. We'd had a flood, so it had changed and that. Oh, not a flood, sorry. We hadn't been back there because... I can't remember. There was a reason we hadn't been back there before then. I think they were the boys had actually been recording Attila's new documentary. So we had to wait for a chance where he wasn't too busy to go back. And there was one weekend, I think, we had a bit of rain, so we couldn't go. And then we finally got this weekend. We got there. We paddled down, found the spot. It was hard to find the spot. It would be the exact same spot in the river and look at it. And we finally got it. We took the photos, put them side by side, and there was definitely nothing there. And so when Attila and Yoey Dan said, why don't we find somewhere we can get out and go in and have a look? So we jumped out of the kayaks. We had to bush bash a bit to get to this spot, and we finally found the exact same spot where this creature was standing. And the only opening where it could have had its head sticking out of the bush, it was about 10 foot high. So it was a lot bigger, and that's when it hit me. This creature's real, and this thing was massive. Like I thought it was big by here, and it walked through the bush, but when I thought it was seven foot tall and to find out it was actually 10 foot tall and being in that bush line, the riverbank was a lot different. Being out in the water, it was all, you could see all the vines and stuff. And when you actually got in behind the vines, it was actually really cut out. So where I thought it was seven foot tall, it was actually, yeah, seven, it was three or four foot deeper in actually underneath the vines than what I thought it was. So this creature was massive. There was no branches in there that a creature could have stood up on. I've had someone say to me, oh, it was a big dog climbed up a tree and I've never seen a dog climb a tree like that and be able to lean out off the tree and look at me, but got in there and there was no little, not even a little branch I could have climbed on, let alone a creature that sounded anything around 500 kilos. So that sort of hit me and it freaked me out a bit and I nearly had a bit of a panic attack then and got back in the kayaks, went home and yeah, it was really good that I'd, had me mates that would go back with me and like I was saying it sort of freaked me out a bit then but since then I've had a few other little encounters with other things and I sort of learned to 
take it a bit better and nothing's happened to me so far. I don't want to be the unlucky person that does get eaten one day, but these creatures are out there and we should be talking about them a bit more. So it sort of gives me the courage to go out and look a bit more. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad to hear you're taking all this in stride. You mentioned the picture you took of that big dog man. Would you mind if I showed it now for the listeners who are checking out the YouTube version of tonight's show? Go for it, mate. Do you put them up and I put a little video together and it's got, I'm not sure if I sent you the photos with them in the different filters and stuff. A lot of people said they couldn't see it properly. So I put a few filters on it and did I send you them ones through or? You did. You sent me the pictures of the filtered version of that original as well as the original. So if you don't mind, I'll just post the original and the filtered versions. Yeah, go for it, mate. Okay, I appreciate it. Your second encounter happened three days after you had that first one. You don't frighten easily, do you? You got right back on the horse. Yeah, well, like I said, I went to a different spot. By car, it was a fair way, but after I'd had this encounter, I went home and realized as the crow flies, it was only about 10 to 12 kilometers away. So really, I was pretty silly going back there. I thought it was a fair way away and it wouldn't have been an issue, but by the size of this creature being 10 foot tall and the way it had run through the bush at me the first encounter, like I should have known like that's not really far for a creature of that size to move. Yeah, not far at all. Do you have any opinions on why that creature ran towards you vocalizing the way it did when you had that first encounter? No, nah, maybe like as I was saying, like I was thinking I might have been one of the first ones down there ever in a kayak fishing. So maybe I'd startled it or it might have been more than the one down there. I know a lot of people when they've had encounters with Bigfoot or Sasquatch and that, like they'll have one creature show itself or roar at them. And at the same time, while that's happening, they hear something move out to the left or the right. Like maybe it had done that to try and get my attention away from something that else that was in the area or I might have just been in its territory and it was the wrong time and it, it wasn't happy that I was there. Well, of course, I could be wrong, but I bet good money it was doing that just to get a rise out of you. Yeah, exactly. It might have been just thought, ha, huh, there's a little, little person down there. Let's go scare it. Pretty much. Yeah, I'll bet you that's what was going on. In reference to that voice you heard in your head, have you ever heard any disembodied voices like that before? No, nah, I've never never heard anything like it. Like I was saying, it wasn't my own thoughts. It wasn't even any of the, my friends or family or that. It wasn't the same voice. It was just this real stern voice say, go now, you'll die. I don't know what it was. I don't know where it come from, but I listened and I, I got out of there. And thankfully, I got out of there safe and sound. So whether it was this creature or, as I said to you before, I've got ancestors that are Aboriginals, like the native people of Australia, and whether I might have been picking up on one of my ancestors, maybe might have been coming through to me telling me go now or I was going to die, or yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure, but the only thing I've sort of seen on the internet is a lot of people have these encounters with dogmen, so maybe it was this creature warning me. Well, as you know, a lot of eyewitnesses have reported that, so if it was that dogman, then... You wouldn't be the first eyewitness to report that. Yeah. And you just touched on this. You've got Aboriginal heritage. Do you think that might predispose you to having experiences with dogmen that most people wouldn't? Yeah, well, I've had a few of my friends say that to me. And I remember when I was, like, years ago when I was a kid, we knew we had Aboriginal heritage, but we didn't know anything about it. I think I spoke to you before. There was a big massacre of the Aboriginal people in this area was a lot of my family members back in the 1800s so there was only two or three that survived from the massacre and one of them was my grandma's grandmother so we didn't really know anything we lost all the stories all the legends all our family basically so we didn't really know anything about it now I've gotten older I've looked into it more and I've joined the land council to try and find out more about our family and stuff like that but back when we were younger we didn't know much about it. and I remember a, a guy I worked with he was Aboriginal and his dad said to him just wait till you hit about 24 25 when you're out in the bush you'll start picking up on things you've never picked up on before white fellas won't pick up on them and stuff like that and I thought that's pretty interesting and yeah so all these dogman encounters have happened with me since I've been 30 and 
a lot of people have said to me, being Aboriginal, you'll pick up on more spirits and creatures in the bush that most people won't. So it could have something to do with that. I might have just been unlucky that day, these two days, but yeah, it could play a part in it. Well, if you ask me, I think you're definitely unlucky no matter what those two days. After having such a terrifying experience, a lot of people would have given up on going back into the bush. Why do you head back in? Uh, my main reason for me to go back in is I've got a little family. I've got the girlfriend and two young kids. And I just thought, wow, like these creatures are out there and people should know about them. And I was a bit worried of all the times I've gone camping with the kids and fishing and stuff. And I just thought, yeah, it's pretty scary. and. So I've more come forward with my photos just to sort of let people know that, hey, there is creatures out there, whether you've got to be scared of them or not, there is these creatures out there. And it could be the reason that someone might go missing down the river there one day and someone might have seen my photo or heard my story and it might be the enough for them to, people to look in the bush for the person that's missing, not look in the water thinking they've drowned or something like that. So I sort of come forward just to warn people, not to scare people or try and cause a lot of problems it's just sort of people should be allowed to know what creatures are out in the australian bush and there is a lot more out there than what we're being told about yeah if dogmen are out there just imagine what else might be out there yeah exactly yeah it's not a pretty thought if anyone listening wants to hear the gopro audio you told us about recording how can they do that i've got a youtube account it's called uh, creepers cryptid and paranormal corner they can go on there. It's got a GoPro footage. It's got a little video I've put together with all my photos and my encounters with these dog men. So, yeah, they can go on there and have a look. And I've done a few, a couple of little podcasts and that, nothing major. But we were put in lockdown last year, midway through last year with the COVID. And I was still working, but we weren't allowed to go out and do anything after work and stuff. So I sort of made the little podcast and put a few episodes together as my way to get through the boredom and the worry of sitting around at home doing nothing. So it's not too flash. I'm getting a little bit better with them and stuff. And I've done a few other little adventures and a few other spots. I've had encounters with creatures that are on there too. So yeah, it's just creepers, cryptid and paranormal corner. For anyone listening, I'm going to post a link to it. Hope you check it out. Awesome. Thanks, Vic. Oh, you're welcome. If you would have gotten too close to that big dog man that day, do you think it would have attacked you? I'm not too sure. There's, it had every chance it could have got me. Like that first encounter I had, where it had run through the bush and it just stopped just out of sight. The river wasn't really wide there. Like I've said a few times, if there was no trees there and I had a clear run, I probably could have ran and jumped and landed on my kayak. The size of this creature and the the power and how fast it ran through the bush, it probably could have jumped and landed in my kayak with the trees being there. So if it actually wanted to get me, I I don't think I'd be here talking to you guys now. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. If he wanted to hurt you, kill you, you name it, he could have done it. But he did what he wanted to do. Just get a rise out of you. Yeah, exactly. Why do you think it let you know it was there if it didn't want to hurt you? It was weird. Like, that's what I've said. Like, maybe there was another creature. Maybe I had, I don't know, if you, would you call dog man babies pups or? Yeah, pups. They might have had pups there or might have been a big alpha male there might have been a female around or something it was just weird maybe i've just spooked it it didn't pick up on me being there coming down the river i know i've been fishing along the river and i've paddled up close enough to a kangaroo i could lean out and touch it with the paddle before it had actually noticed i was there and took off with space in the other direction there's plenty of times i've paddled up on animals along the river that haven't seen me or heard me and so maybe i just caught it off guard and it's hard to explain because, yeah, like I was saying, I didn't think these creatures were real until I've had these encounters. So I sort of, even now, I still don't really know why they do what they do or how they do it. Yeah, there are a lot of possibilities. We'll never know the answer to that. Yeah, exactly. You saw them about a kilometer from your ute. Did you feel safer paddling back to your ute than you would have felt if you'd run back to it on the other side of the river? No, I didn't feel safe at all, but. I thought it's going to be quicker to get out of there and get home. After I took them photos, I never heard it again. So whether it realized 
sounds silly. Maybe it picked up that I took photos of it. I don't know how smart these creatures are. It might have known what I'd done and it's gone, oh, I shouldn't have shown myself and stayed away or maybe my camera might have spooked it out or whatever it was. It, it was definitely after I took them photos, I didn't hear one more noise after that. So obviously it had taken off. So Or it had just sat there, but I thought I'm just getting back to the ute and going and getting out of there because it would have been waiting half an hour for someone to come over to pick me up, load up, drive back to the ute, get home. It would have put everyone out, so I thought, I haven't heard it, so I'm just going to head for the ute. Sure was a difficult situation he put you in, and you just handled it the best way you knew how. How smart do you think dogmen are, John? It's hard to say. I think they're pretty smart. At first, I thought, oh, it's, the creature's not smart at all, like it's shown itself. I've heard it stalking me through the bush, but now, after thinking about it, like I think it was more of an, it was trying to intimidate me than trying to be sneaky and not get caught it's known i've seen it it known i knew it was there like it was just intimidation and stuff like that so for it to get around in this area that it's in around three four on one side of the river there's like say you just go for kilometers and kilometers 20 kilometers it's always it's all houses the other side of the river it's a bit of a national park and then the other side of that there's i think there's sydney's population 10 million so you think being 20 minutes from Sydney, there's a, a lot of houses. Like there'd be two, three, four hundred thousand houses all within 20 minutes of this river. These creatures must be pretty smart to be getting around in this bush without being caught more often. Since I had my encounter, I was thinking I'd never heard of an encounter in Australia. And since then, talking to other people, there's they said there's plenty of them. There's not a lot. There's not as many as Yowie sightings, but there is becoming more encounters with dogmen than first thought. So they must be pretty smart to be getting away with the things that they're doing and not being caught. Oh, sure. Very smart. Have you been back to the location of that second encounter since you went back with your mates? Uh, since going with my mates, no, nah, I haven't been back since. After I went back with my friends, it was only a month or two was when the lockdowns hit last year. And you weren't allowed to travel further than five kilometres from your house. And as I was saying, it was about 30-minute drive from my house, so about 30, 40 kilometres. So I couldn't go there. I think the lockdowns went for about six, seven months over here. It was hard because I had to work through the whole time. Like I still did construction. I could still leave the house and go to work, but I wasn't. we weren't allowed to go anywhere. You could go down the park for an hour or so. And so that sort of stopped us. And since then... Coming out of the lockdowns, it rained for nearly six months over here. We're having massive floods every couple of weeks and haven't really had a chance. It's just over 12 months since I went back with the Tiller and Yowie Dan. I think that was in about March, so it's been a year and a bit. But since the lockdowns, it's been about just over a year. We're finally getting good weather and that again now, so we'll be able to get over there. I've been to the place where the first encounter had happened. I've pulled up a few times there with with my girlfriend and the kids. The second encounter, it's sort of, you can't go there unless you jump in the kayaks and paddle there. There's nowhere to walk. But the first encounter I had, where the parking was, there's a big kids park there. So since then, like, we've had a weekend where we've gone over there. My father-in-law's got race horses over there. So we went over to check the horses out, get some takeaway at the shop, get some fish and chips, and go sit down the park at this first encounter like location let the kids play at the park and there was one day we went down to the water to have a look and i was telling the girlfriend about oh it's down that direction and took the daughter down to the water so you can see the water there's a bit of a waterfall there and that and we were standing there and my daughter said dad can you hear that and off right in the distance you could hear that same roar that i'd gotten when this creature had run through the bush at me and she looked at me and says, Dad, your friend knows you're here. And she sort of laughed and walked off and that sort of freaked me out. I thought, oh, does this creature know that I've come back or is it just a coincidence? But, yeah, she was laughing about it. Oh, Dad, that creature knows you're back. Your friend, huh? Yeah, that's what she said. And There was another time we stopped over there again and we didn't go down near the water. We just pulled up near the park and as we jumped out of the car, my daughter was still in the car. She hadn't got out, but I seen my girlfriend look at me. She went white. She goes, can you hear that? And after she said that, I could hear about a second later, I heard that same roar again coming from that same general area. That sort of freaked us out a bit. 
So that's twice I've been back over there and heard a roar from this creature. So, yeah, whether it picks up that I'm there, whether they could smell me or they've marked me or whatever it is that, yeah, two times out of coincidence, we've, we've all heard this creature roar again. I'm sure that did freak you out. Yeah, that sounds like a good area to stay away from. Yeah, so we haven't been back in the kayaks back, like, in that spot, and I don't think I ever will unless I can take a machine gun with me or something like that, but it's pretty freaky. Sure sounds like it. Do you have any interest in researching dogmen, John, now that you know they're right there in your backyard? Yeah, I sort of do. It's just, I don't really know how to. It's both these encounters, even with my Yao encounters, all of them have happened when I haven't been out looking. I've been doing other things. I've been out fishing and stuff, and it's just happened. So I don't know how I'd go about looking into Dogman other than just going in and exploring and stuff. And I went out a couple of weeks ago, and I caught some creature. I'm not sure what it was on my thermal camera I've bought. It's poking out from behind a tree, but I don't think it was a Dogman. It might have been more of a Yowie or a Junjadi, which are the smaller Yowies. But other than that, I just sort of I'll just go out on the weekends when I get a chance and see if I can run into one of these creatures or a Yowie. I don't know how to sort of target a dogman yeah, and not have a run in with a Yowie. I don't really know how to do it. Well, be careful what you wish for. I wish I could claim that I've never had a dogman researcher contacting me, begging me for help because the dogman followed him home, but I can't make that claim. It's funny. After the second encounter I had, it was only about a week later, I don't think I've told you this, but I chucked the kayak on the back of my ute the night before. I was getting up about four o'clock so I could drive to this spot and go fishing. I got up in the morning and someone had actually stolen the kayak off my ute. All the straps that was tying it down were all cut and the kayak was gone. And so we called the police, they come and checked all the cameras up the street and that, never seen anything. And dad used to laugh and say, oh, maybe that dog man come and got your kayak. But I hope that's not the case. It, Bad enough, it got stolen. I don't want to find out it was Dogman's come and got it because that was the way I got down there to get the photos. Yeah, if they've resorted to stealing kayaks now, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah, that would have just been a person, but he just, my dad had a bit of a laugh and he's like, yeah, maybe it was the Dogman. He wasn't happy you took photos of him. Well, that I'm sure he wasn't happy about, but he did do a pretty good job of hiding to conceal himself. You can still see him there, but... He didn't give you the best photo opportunity, so you did the best you could. Nah, that's what I mean. I just noticed that black spot in the bush. It was a something that's not usually there and took the photo. So I'm probably happy that that's all I've seen. I couldn't physically work out straight. I didn't go, oh my God, that's a dog man. I'm going to take photos of it. It was more of a, what's that? There's something there in the bush that's not supposed to be there. So I'll take them photos. I reckon if I realized it was a dog man, I probably would have had a heart attack and died on the spot. Probably lucky that it, I didn't work it out. I didn't know what the thing was I was taking a photo of at the time. I'm just glad things turned out the way they did. Yeah, thank goodness for that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you told us about what happened while you were listening to Spotify, not all that long before you had that first encounter. Do you think that was related somehow to that encounter? Yeah, that's weird because a lot of people, when they've had encounters with these creatures, they've had a lot of odd things or what do they call all the all the spooky stuff that happens woo the woo the woo yeah a lot of the woo things people have and like i was saying i've never forgotten me wallet before i know not to because i don't want it to cost me money even get pulled over in the car say by a random breath test or something if you don't have your license it's a hundred dollar fine so i've always got it i don't want to lose my fishing gear i get there the gates were locked at that different spot that the gates had never been locked at. Get to this spot, that music glitches out. Forget me GoPro going down the water, all these things that if I hadn't had this encounter, I wouldn't have thought of. But after having the encounter, a lot of people have said they've had odd things happen to them before they've had an encounter with this creature. So maybe that could explain why these things had happened to me. That or a friend has said maybe all them things happening to you before was your ancestors or something trying to stop you from going to this spot before it had happened. Well, the frustrating thing about that is all we can do is guess. We're never going to know for sure. All we can do is just throw whatever we can at the wall and see what sticks. That's right. 
Anytime I've brought an Australian dogman eyewitness on the show, comments came in from Australians who are convinced that there are no dogmen there. What would you say to those people about that? No, I'd say to them, I, I was in the same boat. I thought it was all a lie. And like I was saying, I used to laugh about it and think, how funny is this? Yeah, right, there's a werewolf coming through the bush. But after these encounters, they're 100% here in Australia. I'm not sure how long they've been here for. I personally haven't found any lore of them being here like back in the old times or anything like that. Like this place is in Kakadu National Park. There's cave paintings of Yowies. There's cave paintings of big black panthers and stuff like that. There's been no mention of dog man, but since then I've heard a few things and I've had other people find things out about them. They might be this different creature. They are a dog man, but the Aboriginals might have thought of them as like a dingo man or something like that. But yeah, I thought it was all a lie too, but if you're not going to believe them, you're not going to believe it until you have an encounter with these creatures. And I really hope they don't get to have encounters with these creatures because they're not good. Well, you know, it is. A lot of people out there wouldn't believe in their existence unless they were bitten in the butt. You have concerns about the fact their existence hasn't been acknowledged by your government. Please expand on that for us. I know it would cause chaos and stuff like that, but I just, having a young family, it's worrying that these creatures are out there and other people in my position with young kids don't know what to look out for in the bush. It's bad enough we've got to look out for snakes and spiders and the odd wild dog, but now with my encounters, I've had encounters with Yowie's dog man, big black panthers, like a cougar looking big cat one day. Like there's all these other creatures out there that people don't really know about. And I just think that they have the right to know that there's more things out there than they've been told. But as we've spoken about, it would be complete mayhem if they come out and told everyone about these creatures because people couldn't handle it. You just have to look how the people in Australia reacted with lockdowns with the toilet paper. People were going crazy. There was people fighting on the streets to get toilet paper, and oh, that was mayhem then. So if they were to turn around and say, guess what, guys, there's a big dog-headed humanoid that walks around the bush line too around your houses, I don't think anyone would really be able to handle that. You're right. Yeah, I definitely don't think it would be all that well-received. Yeah, I just, like I was saying, I just come forward and hope it can help someone be found or whether people believe it or not, they be in the same sort of area someone could go missing and like i was saying it could be the difference between someone looking in the bush for the person or trying to drag net the river looking for someone that drowned someone might go oh remember that story john was talking about with the dog man maybe this person's ran off into the bush scared or maybe they've been dragged off in the bush and they might find someone alive but it might be that one thing that helps someone actually collect the body of their loved one or a friend or a family member and actually be able to put them to rest the way they deserve rather than just being forgotten in the bush. Yeah, that's just one of the many aspects about this whole thing, about the government's not allowing this to be let out. That just is so sad. Yeah. Really sad. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, John, but before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? No, it was really good to come on here and get the um, listeners, if they want to have a look at the photos and see if anyone they know in Australia might have seen a creature like this and we might be able to learn a bit more about this creature. Like it's obviously out there and it's living around people and we should try and learn a bit more about them and might be able to understand the why they do the things they do, whether it's just for fun. They might be bored. They've never seen people before or see what people think about it if they let you know and we can go from there. And if they wanted to check out the stuff that I put together, like I was saying, it's just Creepers, Cryptid and Paranormal Corner and, just like to thank you for having me on. It's been awesome. I was talking to Attila Coldy this morning and actually said to him, oh, I'm a bit nervous. I've listened to his podcast for so long and it's a pretty big podcast. I was actually a bit nervous to come on and talk to you this morning. It's been good. <laughs> no, don't get nervous. It's just a podcast. That's all there is to it. And you did a great job. So you should be proud. Uh, thanks for that, mate. It's been awesome. Well, you're welcome, bud. Just telling it like it is. But having said that, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. No worries, mate. Yeah, like I said, I appreciate you having me on and being able to tell you my encounters and hopefully get the word out a bit more in Australia that these creatures exist. Well, like I told you before, I just appreciate you coming on and doing this. So 
Thanks again for your time. Have a great night.